And welcome to the program today on this uh, April 12th, finally Friday. Not quite a free-for-all, but we can uh, maybe do some free-for-all tendencies. Bridget, how are you doing? What are your thoughts on that? It's uh, looking like it'll be a nice I, weekend. I think that today is a day, Justin Storm, where maybe instead of us giving away gifts to people, maybe they should be calling up to give you gifts because in case those of you missed mm. it, it is happy birthday, Justin Storm. I had to bake you a cake, but we're not both in studio today, so I'm going to have to eat that by myself. Sorry. That's all right. The next time you're in studio <laughs> in a couple of weeks, you can drop it off. Okay, I'll do what I can. But... Schedule ahead of you, don't you? Yeah, I'll see you in like a month. But nonetheless, <laughs> <laughs> happy birthday, Mr. Storm. How come Dean made you work and he flew on out of here and left you yeah. to your own devices? He took a vacation. He was going to take, he was going to go uh, Saturday to Wednesday. And then he's like, yeah, no, psych. I'm going to go Saturday to Sunday. So he extended a few <laughs> extra days. And Dean is pretty notorious for taking the day off after he gets back. So he probably won't work until the following Tuesday after next week. Are we starting but a betting board? Right. I mean, I'm looking at my calendar. Maybe I should start planning ahead for, you know, what's the over under on his return date. We'll figure that out. <laughs> we could put some bets on there. I think that'd be a fun <laughs> thing to bet on. Who knows? It's a wild card when it comes to Dean showing up after vacation. Just never know. Absolutely. Oh, mm -hmm. man. So many cool things going on, though. Big shout out to uh, Gowan Company. They are one of our Here We Grow sponsors. Thanks for giving me the Sonaland shirt. So anytime I get sponsor shirts, I always make sure to let folks know that that's that's something I appreciate, and I'm happy to wear them on the live stream and advertise a little bit. Although I should probably be taller so everybody can actually see when I'm wearing someone's <laughs> clothing that they sent me. <laughs> Just pan the camera Oops. down. Yeah, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. So yeah, that's all right. By the way, what birthday weather did you get today? It's pretty nice out there, I think. <clears throat> It's very nice out there, and it's a, a pretty nice weekend. There are some scattered showers that are going to come in on Saturday, but those will mainly be north of I-94 and really see on a course from Devil's Lake to Grand Forks and over into areas of northwestern Minnesota. So I'll give you the details on your Saturday here in just a moment, but it is a very nice start to our day right now. We're looking at temperatures in the mid fifties and uh, 57 reported out at Hector wind is out of the West at seven miles per hour. And we'll top out in the upper fifties, to low sixties today with light wind, partly cloudy skies for tonight. It's mild. We're staying above freezing in the lower forties with a Southeast wind 10 to 15. And on Saturday, there will be a pretty good bet for a few spotty or a few scattered showers passing to our north in the morning to afternoon. Uh, we should remain dry here in the FM metro and area south of I-94 through the morning and afternoon. I can't completely rule it out that we see one, but we should remain dry for almost all of the day until we head towards the late afternoon and evening. I do think we'll see a couple of spotty showers pass along the 94 corridor as a whole. Saturday's looking pretty nice in our area. It'll be partly cloudy, mid, a few upper 70s. I wouldn't be surprised if a localized area topped out at 80 degrees to our south on Saturday afternoon. So it's going to be very warm. The wind will be light, and as we head into Sunday, not too bad. Upper 60s, low 70, light wind, mainly sunny skies. It's not till next week we see changes for a chance for some wider spread rains coming in later in the day on Monday, Monday night, all day Tuesday, and then probably a few spotty showers on Wednesday. But I think we'll tap into dry air, and that should cut off all of the moisture on Wednesday. Outside of it just being windy and temperatures taking a dive into the 40s by Thursday of next week for high temperatures. Wow. So it'll get a little chilly. There's a possibility, Bridget, we could mix in a little wet snow rain mix. And, you know, I'm not saying there's going to be an accumulating snow out of this, but hypothetically speaking, even if we do put an inch or two of snow on the ground... It would melt off really fast. Probably by the next day it would be gone, if not by the end of the day. Oh, absolutely, because our ground is warm enough for that to happen. Additionally, you've already got uh, crops, the crop that's gone in the ground, so especially on those acres where they've done soil disturbance, and so you've got that nice black soil really bringing in the sun's heat, and it's going to warm up very nicely. Mm -hmm. it looks it's good. It's going to bring in some, uh, some needed moisture, you know, a little extra moisture to get things started for the spring that'd be nice so just about everybody on the 
eastern half of our state should be able to at well, least pick up close to a quarter inch of rain. A lot of spots will see a half inch to over an inch. The uh, highest amounts will be in know, Minnesota. You've got some folks that are feeling really good about their moisture situation. They'd be okay if it waited a little bit so they could get the crop planted. Uh, you know, again, Phil out in Western Cass County was quick to point out that he had wanted a forecast midweek because he wanted to know if he should be planting wheat this weekend. And he's going to, as far as I know, so he gets his wheat in the ground before we get the rainfall. On the flip side of that, you know, last summer you saw some areas in, through the traditional Midwestern states, all the I states and into Ohio that were running kind of dry. Believe it or not, Ohio right now, I talked to a farmer friend out there this morning. They've had four inches of rain in the last two weeks. It's a little damp in Ohio. They would like to plant yeah, a crop and they're uh, not there yet. It's a little wet for them, but they uh, they got another round of showers coming through. What is that? The soon? 18th Somewhere or 19th, soon? Sometime next week. That storm system that's going to rip through our area the beginning of next week will eventually make its way to the East Coast by uh, Thursday into Friday. And that'll bring another line of showers and storms across areas, uh, you know, Illinois over towards Indiana and Ohio. Areas south of there could get a, a little line of some thunderstorms to pass through there that could be on the strong to severe side. So definitely a good rainmaker Absolutely. before crops start to come up. And you know what? We're going to be good with that. Um, let's get that crop out of the ground. Let's get it moving fast. And also let's get those pastures to start showing a little bit of green. Um, I think as you go south of I-94, you're probably seeing that. By the way, if anybody wants to be sending us photos of what it's looking like out there, you're getting some greened up pastures, etc. You can feel free to send them to us, either ag or weather at flagfamily.com. Those are our emails. You can give us a call on the Red Wing Shoe Shoe Line, 701-293-9000. And when you send us those pictures, we'll put them on our live stream, which runs on our pages on Facebook, YouTube, and Acres TV. So any of the above, we'd love to have you join in. But right now, my one, it's a little spotty yet. It's not quite there. We'll get there. Yeah, mine's mine's coming in pretty nice so far up in Grand Forks. Uh, <clears throat> there are some areas that are more green than my yard and other areas that are a lot more dead still. But uh, I'd say it's coming <laughs> along pretty nice. I was, I was thinking about picking up some fertilizer and throwing it on uh, tomorrow afternoon or something or uh, maybe <gasps> uh, Sunday afternoon and throwing some fertilizer on there for some rain on Monday. Let me just get this straight because it is... Happy birthday, Justin Storm. And you're going to get fertilizer. Are you going to go just get a load of crap? Or are you are just going to actually get fertilizer instead? I thought I'd check which one you're getting. I'm going to get some Scott's granules, the triple action All right. fertilizer. Oh, will go big or go the, home. Oh, yeah. We got to prevent the emergence <laughs> of all the nasties and uh, feed the lawn, feed it. <laughs> Let them go. We go. We'll see how. I'm not Irish enough to pull be. that one off. You know, the downside of fertilizing your lawn that much is all the mowing you're going to have to do. You may want to invest in a mini baler or some small cows, maybe some highlanders or something that could keep the keep the grass so down for you. The, here's the thing. We got a gas mower and, you know, it's not it does a good job, but by no means would I say that it's a really good mower. I mean, like it sucks, but it doesn't suck that well. And uh, mm -hmm. the lifting, you know, to set the height, it, it, you know, it works. But I've been thinking about getting one of those electric mowers because, you know, our yard's not not the greatest or not the largest, I should say. It's nothing like an electric mower can handle. And I was kind of debating between like the, uh, I have all the Milwaukee tools. That's what I started off with. So I can't switch in between different things now because all the batteries aren't compatible. But I've been debating between the Milwaukee or the Ego and the Ego one just kind of looks kind of cool but it's a lot cheaper than the milwaukee one is so i don't know if anyone well, has some of these electric mowers if you want to call in let us know what you think about them and how they work 701-293-9000 i do think that the ego does a good product it's hard for me to not stay on brand just simply because you have all the batteries and so forth i mean it's like raising uh, Black Angus, and all of a sudden you made this giant switch over here to like a Charlet, right? So you, you totally mixed it up in there. This this might throw your whole herd off, but it might just work for you. We'll see what that looks like. Right. And I think we got a few um, people over there on the phone lines right now. Why don't ooh. we uh, bring in uh, Greg to the show? Greg, welcome to uh, Weather and Ag and Focus. What's going on? 
Yeah, Howdy. Yeah, here's an old uh, here's an old farmer trick as far as putting uh, uh, fertilizer and stuff on your uh, on your city lawn. Uh, Dad used to like to go out uh, early in the morning, and there was dew on the ground. And then he said you could uh, you could see your wagon wheel tracks. He used to have a, a, a roller spreader, a uh, little one spreader with two wheels on it, and he'd load it up with weed and feed and and fertilizer. And then he'd say you get out there early in the morning when there was dew. And he said, you could see where you've been. Otherwise, because, you know, you go up and down, you kind of lose track where you're. Uh, but if you could see where the wheels were, you uh, had an idea. So you didn't over overspread or overseed, whatever. Or he said, huh. if it was in the afternoon, like if it was in the afternoon, like you're going to do, he said, just take a garden hose and uh, and just spray the lawn. And he said, then just jump on your spreader or whatever. If you got a, a broadcast spreader that you push, just spray the lawn when in the afternoon and then you can see where the see where the wheels were and see where you've you've covered and where you haven't covered so hey right on well uh, appreciate the tip there greg thanks for calling in and sharing that might have to try that out yeah we got uh john on line two i got a couple open lines if you want to sneak in here 701-293-9000 uh john welcome to the show what's going on man happy birthday hey thanks john <laughs> I got a dump truck full of crap if you need some fertilizer. <laughs> you know, you can you drive her up north and you uh you can unload it, I guess. <laughs> yeah, you just you gotta guess which house is mine though. You gotta guess. Like I say, you'll have to you'll have to spread it yourself there, buddy. <laughs> yeah, you just pick a random house and we'll call it so, mine, all right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I know where Dean's house is, so you can't pull that one on me, I can tell you that. Well, We'll drop it off at his house then. He's gone for a week. That'd be a, a nice, nice little welcome home present. <laughs> oh my! So, uh, so I want to ask you that question. You know me. I'm always dinging around with small engine stuff. Why is your more a piece of crap in your eyes? What's wrong with it? Well, you What's know, it's just a, it's the just blade, a, you know, <laughs> it's just an old little lawnmower. It's nothing special. We got it on the side of the berm on berm cleanup week a couple years ago. See, those are great mowers. I mean, it gets the job you know. done, but I mean, well, maybe but if just you don't not quite the, the one I would change like. The oil, you know, like you know, like Jay Thomas, Mister, my snowblower hasn't had the oil changed since I bought it. You know. Wait, 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 wait. So you're telling me you have to change the oil on your lawn mowers, John? Uh, yeah, yeah. That's that's a good idea if you want them to last. <laughs> Same with sharpening the blade. Otherwise, uh... otherwise you're making those ragged cuts. The other thing that people don't realize, and, and, and they call me the grass Nazi in Fargo for a reason, but, you know, excessive long grass is not good, but excessive short grass is also not good. Bridget can back me up on this. This is related to overgrazing. It will, you and know, it'll have actually, nothing but weeds left for you. Exactly, because uh, weeds will grow way faster than grass will, especially grass that's at about, say, uh, right around three inch maybe three and a half if we start into a dry spell because you're shaving yeah, like, the roots of the grass and that, that helps the grass. Yeah, I like to keep ours about two and a half, three inches, but I uh, appreciate the phone call, John. We got to get rolling, but thanks for listening. Thanks for calling. Uh, Bridget, you had a listener comment, didn't you? I do. And in fact, Addison recorded it. So Addison, could you do that for us, please? Yeah, I had a caller who called in a couple of minutes ago. He just wanted to say happy birthday, Justin, and to pass along a special message for you. <laughs> we're done i think we're going i know to break. who that was <laughs> we are coming back with our guest today she's going to be a south dakota farm girl galley wallachek galley's going to join us from colorado we're going to talk about all things beef and so much more stay tuned
Welcome back to Weather and Ag in Focus and a giant happy birthday to Justin Storm. So glad you're here with us to celebrate his birthday. And we've had so many listener contributions today. One of them, I got a message from someone who is down in South Dakota uh, up on I-29, said east of Sioux Falls, they intend that corn, at least on one farm, will all be planted by Thursday of next week. Soil temperatures there at about 49 degrees. So things are progressing rapidly towards hashtag plant. 24. And we have an awesome guest to visit with today who's also going to be bringing information from South Dakota, even if she currently lives in Colorado. And that is Gally Wallatick. And Gally, how are you today? Good morning, Bridget. I am doing pretty good. The sun's shining here in Colorado, so I can't complain. <laughs> that sounds awesome. Okay. All right. Tell us, who's Gally? What do you, who are you? What do you do? Where'd you come from? Bridget, that is such a loaded question. <laughs> so yes, I'm Gally Waltich. I uh, grew up outside of Eden, South Dakota, my family's farm. I uh, went to high school and elementary school in Britain, South Dakota, where I had, I think, a very special childhood. It's probably pretty similar to uh, a lot of the kids who grew up on a farm. Um, found myself at SDSU. I don't know if you can see behind me, Bridget. I was going to take this video call from a conference room, but I can't miss an opportunity to say go Jacks. <laughs> so I ended up at SDSU and found myself here in Colorado at the NCBA office. Okay, so I also am making sure that you can see my picture behind me too, because if we're going to have this discussion, there's going to be plenty of, of state school affiliations. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> That's right. Yes. Well, I have a little bit to brag about this year, so I'm I'm happy to talk football. <laughs> and rightfully so, you should. Now, as a kid growing up in South Dakota, um, where were you headed? Did you always think you'd be getting back into the livestock industry? So, no, I didn't. Uh, I grew up on a farm, uh, showed sheep, pigs, cattle, whatever, and 4-H. Uh, loved my life on the farm. As I got older, it it seemed like the opportunities, um, you know, as a middle school and high school student for me in Marshall County uh, weren't there. And I, it's something I didn't really realize until I was older. Um, we didn't have an FFA program at Britain's, Britain's High School. We didn't have uh, an egg program. And so, you know, children are sponges. And what I found my passions in were athletics, um, our fax classes, whether that's home ec or our pro start program, um, and started kind of leaning into more of the event planning, hospitality, restaurant side of um, what I was learning. And so after graduating from Britain, I went to South Dakota State. I didn't really fully have a plan besides the fact that I wanted to be on the cheer team. Um, and so I knew I wanted to go to SDSU. I knew I wanted to be on the cheer team. That had been a lifelong dream of mine. Um, so got to SDSU, started to um, take some marketing classes. Didn't think that was totally up my alley. So um, after some conversations with my high school fax teacher, she really pushed me to join the hospitality management major um, at SDSU. So uh, started doing that, really got into the event planning side of things. I worked with a event planner in Brookings, South Dakota, Hitch Studio. If any of your listeners are planning on getting married, they are a fantastic uh, wedding planning company. So make sure you reach out to them. Um, and so that's kind of where my passions were when I was um, out of high school and high school. And so I found myself my junior year looking for internships. I thought maybe something in Nashville. I love country music. Um, I love bringing people together. And so I was starting to look at Nashville and then I looked at how much it costs to live in Nashville. And I thought, mm, <laughs> I don't, I don't think that's going to work for me. <laughs> and so uh, my sister lives in Denver and so I started looking for internships in Denver in the hospitality industry. And the first thing that pulled up was an internship with NCBA on their meetings and events team. And um, I thought, well, I know who NCBA is. This, this sounds like a very cool opportunity. So I put my name in the hat, not really thinking I would get the job or get the internship or go anywhere from there. Um, and so that's kind of how I stepped back into working for agriculture, um, having that passion. And so uh, after 
my first internship with NCBA here, I decided I loved it. I love the people I worked with. I love the mission of NCBA. I love what they do. And I especially love the people they work for and what they're doing uh, each and every day for American cattle producers. So that's a little bit about how I got back into egg um, <laughs> from a hospitality <laughs> management major. Wow. Well, let's hit on the, the NCBA when we come back from break. But before we get to that, let's go back a little bit to the family farm when you were growing up. Was it cattle? Was it crop? Was it both? What was going on when you were a kid on the farm? Yeah, it was both. So my family raises Simmental Angus cattle. So uh, there was always cows around, whether it was um, at our place where I grew up, at the main farm, wherever. A um, lot of cattle and then my family uh, farms a few acres of crops as well. Right. And what would you like more between them, the crops or the cattle and why? I mean, have you seen a baby calf? <laughs> Definitely the cattle <laughs> um, is, <laughs> is kind of where I had more passion. Um, we, you know, when I was growing up in 4-H, we would pick up a few sheep for me to mess around with, a few pigs. Um, I loved my sheep. My sheep were not sheep, though. They were basically dogs. They were free range. <laughs> they would lay on the porch. They would greet the mailman when he came up to the house. I mean, they were, <laughs> <laughs> they were not livestock. Those were fully pets. <laughs> But uh, anything animals, I'm a huge animal lover, always have been. So, Right. And what were some of your takeaways from that? Starting at a young age until you left home, what were some of the things you learned or took away that you still use today or has still tagged along with you today from those experiences? I think, I mean, and this is something that you realize at an older age. Growing up on a farm in a small town, you don't appreciate it until you step away from it. Um, and, and that's the case for me, at least. Um, probably my biggest takeaway was growing up, learning from my mom, my dad, um, my entire family is the importance of having a work ethic and having a passion to get up each and every day and do something you love, uh, knowing what you're doing is for a greater purpose. So I, I would say tenfold the work ethic and the morals I, I learned on the farm were something I can take away. Cool. Well, we're at the bottom of the hour. We got to get caught up with local news here. But when we come back, we want to know more about what the NCBA is and what it is you're doing with them. Because I know Bridget knows about this. I have no idea. I don't know anything about it. And I know the urban half of our listening audience also probably has no idea what it is. So we need to learn what it is and what they're doing. And we'll get all those questions answered. And yours, if you have any, 701-293-9000 is the Red Wing Shoes phone line. Emails are weather or ag at flagfamily.com and comment boxes there on Facebook and YouTube Live. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to Weather and Ag in Focus. And with our guest today, that is Gally Waltish. Gally is with North National Cattlemen's Beef Association. So Gally, there are some folks that aren't even familiar with what NCBA is. So do you want to describe that organization for us? Yes, well, we use a lot of acronyms. Uh, so NCBA is the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. So NCBA is the largest and the oldest national trade organization representing uh, cattlemen and women uh, throughout the United States. So we have uh, 44 state affiliate organizations uh, ranging from California to New York and anywhere in between. Uh, the reason we don't have all 50 is because not all 50 states have a state cattlemen's organization. Uh, they bring us our policy and tell us what we need to work on and our membership leads our direction in Washington, D.C., where we have a full staff fully equipped on their issues that they focus on uh, in order to make sure what's happening in D.C. is the direction that American cattle producers want to see. <laughs> That's okay. Justin and I are go are making sure we're not over talking over the top of each other. Okay, so with National Cattlemen's, what's the role that you play, Gally? What's the current job that you're doing? Because you started with events, but where are you at now? Yeah, so I started with the events team, like I said, um, until a opportunity popped up in the membership department. So I am the director of membership and affiliated services. Uh, so with that, I cover 13 of those 44 state affiliate organizations. So I cover the upper Midwest and Northeast. So North and South Dakota to New York is my territory. What do you do for them? Well, <laughs> it kind of depends <laughs> on the day. <laughs> so uh, my day-to-day, okay. -day, I kind of have two funnels of what I do. The first funnel is the membership portion. So that's uh, overseeing our membership programs. Uh, sometimes it's answering phone calls. Sometimes it's as simple as renewing a membership over the phone. Sometimes uh, it's a little more strategic than that. So that's the membership funnel. And then the second funnel is the affiliated services side. So that's providing resources and um, communication to those 13 state affiliates. I work very closely with uh, the executive directors for those state affiliates. Um, and that's kind of the same thing. It depends on the day what the request is and what they need from NCBA. But uh, my main goal here is to be a resource uh, for our state associations to make sure we're doing what they want us to be doing. Okay, so every farm kid with cattle is like, okay, that sounds like fun. I get to direct traffic, so to speak. But what's your travel schedule like, Gally? Because you and oh. I know each other well <laughs> enough that um, I know that your suitcase has some dents and miles on it. It does, probably as many as yours, Bridget. Uh, yeah, so last year, I think I had 48 flights booked through United, and so I had a handful of other airlines, but uh, it's it's a few times a month, typically, I'm on the road, whether I'm in Illinois, whether I'm in Pennsylvania, or whether I'm in North Dakota. Uh, so I try to hit all of my 13 state affiliates at least once, uh, throw a few NCBA sponsored events in there too. I'm, I'm on the road quite a bit, which uh, I, I thoroughly enjoy. That's where I get to go and see uh, the people who invest in membership with NCBA, the people who are working every day on the farm um, and then they can tell me if we're doing the right thing or maybe we need to take a look at how we're operating. So it's it's my favorite part of my job is being on the road. So that's actually kind of leads to the question is, you know, if you're working for NCBA and they're a producer led organization, how do you affect a producer on a daily basis? Or how does the organization do that if you think about it? Yeah, so I mean, number one would just be political insurance. You can go to ncba.org and take a look at our policy book to see uh, what it is we're working on. Um, I do want to mention how NCBA drafts policy is very unique. So our 44 state affiliates bring forth the policy passed through their state organization. They bring it to NCBA uh, where it's broken into one of seven different committees where in those committee meetings are our 44 organizations um, and some of our councils and national breed affiliates. Uh, everything is looked at, discussed, voted on there. It's brought to the board of directors meeting where again, in the room, all those 44 state affiliates, councils, breed affiliates, et cetera, are there to vote on the policy. And after that, it is sent out in a ballot to every single NCBA member. Um, so anything we're working on is 
truly coming from the grassroots level. It's not anyone here in our uh, NCBA office, whether it's Denver, DC, deciding what it is we're working on. It's coming directly from uh, those cattle producers in the states that uh, have state cattlemen's organizations. Um, so that's one way you can look at it. Anything that we're working on is passed and approved and discussed by real working cattle producers, not those of us sitting in this office. Um, but then another way NCBA works for our members is we have a pretty uh, hefty member benefits program where you can save thousands of dollars on, uh, on either equipment, um, propane, uh, tons of different member benefits. I mean, we have 12 different companies, so it's hard to, to remember all of those, but that's a, a few ways that we affect uh, working cattle producers. So from things that you're hearing from producers in your states, what are some of the things that they're asking for or they're talking about? And of that, is any of it contained to the farm bill that's uh, awaited in the distance? Farm bill is definitely a top of conversation and we'll see how long it is top of conversation if it can get passed uh, through through uh, that process. So we're kind of sitting there waiting on that. Um, but I, I am going to defer any policy uh, conversations to our Washington, D.C. office because they are the ones fully equipped to talk about those. And there's things that go over my head when it comes to the nerds and outers of uh, all things policy. I see. Well, how about things in the past then from, say, five to 10 years down the road? What are some changes that NCBA has been responsible for when it comes to cattle producers? Uh, getting WOTUS off the table again <laughs> for uh, when the Biden administration reintroduced uh, that old rule and took away the uh, previous Trump uh, WOTUS is probably our most recent big win. And that is and thanks Wotus, to by the way. Hart. Oh, go uh, ahead, Bridget. Uh, Wotus, Wotus, by, by the way, is the waters of the U.S. So we want to make sure we yes. define that. And, and yeah, Mary Thomas Hart, she is a chief, I think she's chief counsel for NCBA and the work that she did she is. with governmental affairs. She is. Well, she maybe is we could counsel. go a little bit into that with Wotus, because I know that that was a big deal. I know a lot of people like NCBA have never heard of WOTUS because, you know, especially our urban half is not involved in it. This isn't something that really directly affects them, even if it does mm -hmm. indirectly. So maybe we could dive into that. What exactly is WOTUS and what was the big overturn from Trump to Biden? And then what you guys just brought back to the pre-existing or what it was before? So I, uh, I'm going to defer that again. I, I don't want to talk policy here because we have such a awesome staff in Washington, D.C. that can do a much better job of going into the details. Um, and so I urge anyone, if you have questions on WOTUS or anything policy, please call our Washington, D.C. office. They are there. They're happy to talk and they can uh, explain NCBA's policy position and uh, the work that they're doing every day. All right. Oh, before I forget, Kelly, May is beef month. And so mm -hmm. that's coming up faster than we think. And any promotions or ideas that you can think of that we want to be making sure we focus on for May? Buy more beef in May. <laughs> How about that? Yes, uh, May is okay. beef month and that is <laughs> vastly coming up here. We're almost halfway through April, if you can believe that. I can't. Um, so yes, our, our uh, NCBA office is working hard, definitely. Uh, something that I should have mentioned is there's two prongs here at NCBA. One is the policy side that is fully funded through membership. And then the other is the checkoff side that is funded through beef checkoff dollars. Um, we are a contractor to the Cattlemen's Beef Board, where we have uh, some staff members here at NCBA who work on promotion, research, um, and whatnot with the beef checkoff. And so, uh, they are working hard on making sure consumers know uh, how to cook their beef, where to buy their beef, what is, uh, what, where you can buy beef, you know, those types of things. So uh, if you're interested in what they're doing, you can check out your state's beef council. You can go to cbb.org or you can uh, call the Cattlemen's Beef Board. Well, all right. Do you have a phone number for that call or where do you want us to find them? What's the website, et cetera? Oh. 
you know, I don't have a phone number, but I could get one pulled up pretty quick with Google. <laughs> that's perfect because we use that kind of thing all the time. Why wouldn't you, right? That's that's actually quite ideal. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. I do have a phone number for Cattleman's Beef Board. It is 303-220-9890. Awesome. All right. We want to say thank you for joining us today, Gally. We really appreciate uh -huh. that and taking the time to visit. Thank you. Well, thank you guys for having me. Happy birthday, yeah, Justin. No oh, well, thank you very much. Appreciate that. All right. <laughs> well, let's see. Before we head to break here, we got to do a garden trivia brought to you by Cheyenne Gardens. This is going to be not our last time because i think we have one maybe two more to do at the beginning of next week uh but be the first person to call in with the correct answer for this trivia question and you'll win yourself a ten dollar gift certificate to cheyenne gardens that will be valid on this coming monday the 15th of april and that will run through the month and may and i'm pretty sure june as well all you got to do is be the first person to call in with the correct answer. 701-293-9000 is the Red Wing Shoes phone line to call in and your trivia question for today. And I didn't do a very good job of preparing this one. I usually write down the trivia question, but I'm trying to word this as I read it. The crocus flower is responsible for what spice? Okay, so a crocus becomes a uh, spice there mm. is the flower or part of the flower is a spice when you dry it down what spice is the crocus flower responsible for 701 293 9000 is it a super expensive spice maybe you can't even uh, answer you know, that it, 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 maybe either caller what's your name what was that john john what do you think the answer is it's saffron it is saffron and that is the most expensive spice yes, on the it market is. right now to my knowledge. <laughs> yeah it's the uh, the red stigmas of the crocus sativus flower are harvested yep. to create or produce saffron so congratulations there, John. Stay on the line. Our producer is going to get a little information from you, and you'll be able to pick up that $10 certificate courtesy of Cheyenne Gardens for Cheyenne Gardens, Monday through Friday, 8 to 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Yep. Thanks for playing and listening, John. Appreciate it. All right. What do we got to do next? Um, we got to go to break. Should we'll be we right that? back with all of... We need to do that. We have some ag headlines, and I'm sure if people are paying attention, there'll be something coming up about Jay's tax relief from ATI of Fargo, as well as Coast Materials. Just remember that Coast oh Materials doesn't want you to rely. They don't want you to rely on your tax relief fund, so or your tax refund, I should say. So pay attention for this when you get a chance to register to win.
Yes, yes, now you can call. This is the correct time to be calling the Red Wing Shoes shoe line, 701-293-9000. We're doing Jay's tax relief and be caller number seven to win. Hi there, John. Sorry, you're not number seven. Hi there, caller. You're number two. Caller, you're number three, four. Caller number five. Oh, that's caller number five. Sorry. Caller number six. Sorry, you're caller number eight. We'll go back one. Here's caller number seven. Hi there, what's your name? Hi, this is Jim. Jim, you're caller number seven. Congratulations, you're getting qualified to win $1,000 courtesy of Jay's Tax Relief. Well, outstanding. Appreciate that. Yes, no problem. Thanks for listening. Hey, if you do end up winning this $1,000, what would you use it on? I'd probably take you guys all out to lunch. Oh, well, it is Justin's birthday. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, Jim, hey, congratulations. You just got yourself qualified. Stay on the line, though. Our producer is going to get some information from you so we can get you fully registered and all put in the books and squared away, all right? Sounds good. Thanks, Justin. All right. Yep, no problem. There we go. Congratulations, Jim. That was uh, Jay's Tax Relief. We're doing that for the rest of the month. You'll hear uh, the Q call thingy. When you hear it, you call. Sometime between 7, 10 o'clock, 1 o'clock, and 4 o'clock hours, you'll hear that Q mm -hmm. to call sounder. And don't get it mixed up with the promo. I always get a good chuckle when the promo plays, and I just see the phone lines lighting up. <laughs> Not uh, quite that one. <laughs> nope, not quite that so. one. Well, let's see. What do we got? We got some egg topics to get to still for this afternoon, Bridget. And We uh, do. So for, first of all, a big thank you to Morton Buildings for bringing those headlines to us every day. MortonBuildings.com slash careers. They're waiting for you to go check them out. They do indeed have a lot of openings for folks. They want to give you job advancement. They want to help you be a part of a 100% employee-owned team. They have great pay benefits such as quarterly bonuses, trips to other communities like Jamaica. Well, it's a whole country, not a community, but they wanna give you places to go, people to see, things to do, and help you bring them and their plans for great buildings to life for those who are their customers. So check out mortonbuildings.com slash careers. Now, a little fun thing, you know, North Dakota raises a whole lot of soybeans. In fact, the whole region does, but North Dakota is gonna have two new soybean crush plants one is recently online, another soon to come. And one of the things that can happen after that soybean oil is crushed is the pulp is left, the soybean meal. And that meal can actually be used in a firefighting foam. There is a change in the formulation of that foam. Uh, folks don't wanna see some of these forever chemicals, the PFAS products in them. And so in order to make that change over, Wisconsin, their Soybean Association has been working with some other uh, co companies to come up with a plan. They're currently using a soy flour for the foam, but they intend to switch that to a soy meal going to start out by using just 12 million bushels of soybeans. There'll be many more to come, especially as more fire departments see the product and get a chance to use it. So yet another outlet for soybeans all across the region. Oh, that's super cool. And we got something else going on, not just with the soybeans, but uh, I think there's soybean growers that are needed, right? There are. United Soybean Board is looking for growers to serve and be a part of the work that they do and help to do global promotions for our exports of soybean. And so if you are interested in applying by Monday, April 22nd, you could apply for one of North Dakota's three spots on the U.S. Soybean Board. One position is currently open. Cindy Pulsecamp from Hillsboro fills that position. She is eligible for a second term, but you can apply. There can be multiple candidates. And if you want to be considered for this national leadership position, you need to go to the agreement to serve on the unitedsoybean.org page in order to be a part of that process. And well, I did have someone call earlier or email me earlier, said his father-in-law might have an interest. So definitely sending in names for people who might want to apply and be a part of that process. Ah, well, on. how in the world is this weather going to shape up for the rest of your birthday? 
Well, the rest of the day is going to be very nice. Partly cloudy, light winds, temperatures, upper 50s to low 60s. Tonight, lower 40s. Saturday, 70s, partly cloudy. A few scattered showers, mainly to our north. Light wind and to wrap up the weekend on Sunday. Sunny skies, light wind, temperatures, upper 60s to low 70s. Much needed rain on the way for next week. Looks like Monday night into Tuesday, some much beneficial rains. We'll be here soon. That'll do it for us here on Weather and Ag in Focus. Thanks for listening throughout this week. We're back tomorrow, 1 to 2 o'clock in the afternoon. I think Jay Thomas is off today, so I'm not quite sure what's going to happen. I guess we'll find out soon. Have a great day. <laughs>